We want to extend a very special welcome to all of those of you who are joining us virtually uh, across the nation and around the world. We are grateful that you are tuning in here to Columbine United Church. We're especially grateful for all of our men and women in uniform around the world. We are with you. Our prayers are with you. And we are glad that you are a part of us here at Columbine United Church. Let's give them a big round of applause this morning. And now I want to invite to the stage... The Reverend Jane Ritterson. Goodness gracious. That's my payback for the birthday number. (laughs) Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 139, selected verses. Listen for the word of God. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know me when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And our second reading comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God you will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. And our last reading comes from Paul's letter, second letter to the church in Corinth. Chapter 5. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Here ends our readings for the morning. May God grant us understanding of the Holy Word. Amen. Good morning. morning. It is so good to be here with you this morning. Sunday, I will tell you, is my favorite day of the week, followed closely by Friday night. With the snow last week and worship canceled, it took me a few days to regroup. When I miss the rhythm of Sunday worship and the bookends that it provides to my week, I feel all out of kilter. And so I'm really glad to be back here today. I cannot believe that in another week at the beginning of May that John and I will have been in Colorado for a whole year, and I've been here with you at Columbine for a year as well. Yay! (laughs) So thank you for welcoming both of us into your midst with so much grace. We are so, so happy to be here. So today we continue our sermon series on the eighth day. And so right off the bat, in the book of Genesis, when we read the story of God creating the heaven and the earth, we hear about six days of creation and a seventh day of rest. So then we might ask, what is the eighth day? And then I will tell you what I learned this week. The eighth day is also the first day, which is, of course, Sunday. It's all about resurrection and new life. And I will tell you a secret, only because Steve's not here, that I had to text Justin and ask him what the eighth day was. And I thought, well, I felt dumb, and I felt really embarrassed, but then I remembered there was no such thing as a dumb question, so I went ahead. And thankfully, Justin told me not to beat myself up about it. He said, you're probably the only, not the only one that's not clear about it. And I'm grateful to have a colleague who has come from a more conservative background than I, (laughs) because I have spent my entire church life in liberal and progressive churches, and we never talked about the eighth day. However, 
I will tell you that I am a good Presbyterian, and that means I know that today is the fifth Sunday of Easter. So remember that Easter is not one day, but it is an entire season. It is 50 days, seven Sundays culminating with Pentecost Sunday on May 15th, and that is the day that we remember and celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Two weeks ago, Steve talked about the long dirt nap. And I think a better title for his sermon would have been Not the Long Dirt Nap, as he explored his understanding of resurrection. Of course, none of us know exactly what happens after we die, but I for one trust that there is something fabulous waiting for us, which is comforting is that I trust that my parents and others that I love and others that you love are in a really wonderful place right now. I also count on seeing one of the great, great loves of my life on the other side, and her name was Molly Ritterson, and she was a four-legged mutt that I loved more than anything and she absolutely worshiped the ground I walk on. I could do without seeing the endless parade of cats that came through the Ritterson house, and I could definitely do without seeing my son's pet boa that escaped and caused me to lose an entire week's sleep. God may have loved that snake unconditionally, but I assure you, I did not. And all kidding aside, I've thought a lot about the death of my own parents since Christmas Eve when my own mom died. And as Steve recently mentioned, all three of us pastors have lost parents in the last year, which will hopefully inform us so we will be better pastors as we work on our own, own grief process so we can accompany you on your processes of grief. Both of my parents are gone now, and it was really tough the last few years to watch them wither away from the healthy, capable beings that they were into their diminished selves. And of course, we work with death and dying every single week here at Columbine, but somehow losing both of my parents brought the fact of my own mortality even closer. And so I keep asking myself, what can I learn from their lives and deaths to inform me how to live out the rest of my life, knowing, of course, that I won't live forever. None of us will. And I've thought a lot about resurrection, and I have an idea that when we hear the word resurrection, most of us think about Jesus and the empty tomb, or perhaps our own loved ones that have gone before us. And thank God, thanks be to God, that death does not have the final word. There is a place where there is no more pain, no more crying, no more suffering, a place that makes all things new. And yet, resurrection, new life, is not only here for us when we die, but also for the here and now. A couple of weeks ago, Steve also said, there is no hell. Remember, he said, there is no hell. And I agree, almost, <laughs> almost. I believe that there's not hell after we die. God has taken care of that. We don't have to worry about a fiery furnace, so forget about sending people you don't like there. But there is hell on earth. I have been there, and so have many of you. It is a place when we are in deep despair, without hope, turning away from all the good that life has to offer, sometimes not even recognizing God when God is right in front of us. We may be breathing, walking, working, sleeping, eating, but we are essentially the walking dead, just putting one foot in front of the other to get through life. And so I believe that resurrection is more than paradise after we die, but it is the promise of new life for today. And as I mentioned, I've thought a lot about resurrection since Easter, and I've seen it all around me. If only we have ears to hear and eyes to see, we will see resurrection in our midst each and every day. 
The day that my mother died, that morning, my daughter came by the house and told us she was expecting her second baby. And I thought, wow, isn't that a wonderful, wonderful circle of life, new life, resurrection in the midst of death. Life goes on. Recently, we have had two adult education events here at Columbine, and we've been learning about the prevalence of domestic violence and how we might recognize it and how we might safely respond to a friend or a co-worker who is a victim of domestic violence. And of course, with domestic violence, physically, physical violence is only one aspect, but there is sexual, psychological, emotional, and financial violence as one partner seeks to control the other and seeks to have power over the other. And the scary statistic we learn is that one out of four households is affected by domestic violence. Yet, as tragic as that was during these sessions, we heard powerful stories from four or five women who have come out on the other side with good support from families, their churches, social service, and service agencies, and the love of God. The old is gone, and a new life is upon these women as they have started anew. And they were beautiful stories of resurrection, this side of the grave. And I encourage you, if you or anyone you know has concerns about this topic or questions, contact one of the pastors. And while women are most often the victims, men are also victimized by domestic violence. And what I learned from these sessions is that we all have so much more to learn on this topic. This Columbine member and seminary student, Cheryl Swing, has facilitated a couple of educational workshops on gender, identity, and sexuality. And the class that I intended was so informative and interesting, and I learned a lot of new vocabulary and a lot of new facts and figures, but the most powerful part of these classes were the testimonies from several GLBTQ people. And each story had a common theme of rejection early in life, rejection of self, rejection by parents, rejection by the church, rejection by friends, and even they felt like they, they were rejected by God. But over time, the divine has intervened and been at work moving these folks from self-hate to self-acceptance, from hell to resurrection to new life, as each one of them has recognized that from the moment they were in their mother's womb, they were perfectly created, wonderfully created, and they have been loved and cherished by God from day one. New life, resurrection. When I think about resurrection, I also think about my dad, and not particularly after he died, but during the last month of his life. And he taught me that it was never, never too late to reach out for the new. My dad was my greatest cheerleader. He was my teacher, and he was maybe the most loving, generous, and non-judgmental person that has been in my life. He would have told you he wasn't religious, but as I watch my dad, I could see God always at work through his life. He was born to two Italian immigrants, which leads to the fact that he was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. And when he and my mom were married in 1951, it was considered a mixed marriage. My mother, my mother was strong-willed, and converting to Roman Catholicism was not in her plan, and so they were married in the chapel of the Methodist Church. And in those days, that meant my dad would have been excommunicated from the church, which is a super uncomfortable concept for those of us who believe and profess a loving, inclusive, radically inclusive God. It's just out of my range of thinking that a church could turn somebody away because they weren't of the same religion. 
And so early on in my parents' life together, my dad would go to Mass, and my mother would take my sister and I to church. But the story goes that after his own mother died, he stopped going to church until 20 or 30 years later, after my sister and I were launched and on our own, he started going to the Methodist church with my mom, and he became an active and involved member of the church. But during the last months of his life, when it became apparent that he would not live to see the next Christmas, he asked me to stop by the house. He said, Jane, I want you to do me a favor. And so I stopped by and I said, what's up? And one thing he wanted me to do was review his funeral plans with the, um, with the mortuary, and I did that. And then he asked me to be sure that there was a Catholic priest at his funeral. And I looked at him, I said, really? I said, you have not been to Mass for 25 years, except for weddings and an endless parade of funerals. Every single week, you're at Aldersgate United Methodist Church with Mom. Why a priest? And he said, looked at me and he said, once a Catholic, always a Catholic, I want a priest. <laughs> so, <laughs> and even during his repeated hospitalizations on that little box, I think you still can check about religion, he checked Roman Catholic because he wanted the Eucharistic visitors to bring him communion, and indeed they did. And all the while, my mother was sending the Methodist pastors to pray over him. And I think he was covering his bases. And I thought it was a great idea to have a priest. You know, after all these years, if he wanted a priest, why not? And then I said, well, what's mom say about this? And his eyes got real big, and he said, I haven't told your mom, I'm scared to. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, okay, you're not going there now. You've been married over 50 years, and you're going to throw me under the bus after you die. And he said, yep. <laughs> and I said, I thought about my mom, and it would, it would have been a real tough act to convince her to have a Catholic priest. And so eventually I gave him some kind of noncommittal answer, like, we'll see. And I think we all know what that means. And if you don't ask an eight-year-old how often a will see turns into a yes. I felt stuck in the middle. And the weeks went by, and my dad's kept declining. And then he called me another day and asked me to come by. And he said, guess what? I'm like, what? He said, I had your mom take me to the new member class at the Methodist Church. <laughs> I, he's wild. So at the age of 80, with his death, death rushing toward him at warp speed as his cancer progressed, this once a Catholic, always a Catholic, was letting go of the past, and he was grabbing on to this new life in the last days of his life. And by the time the Sunday came for him to stand in front of the church and answer the questions like Kelly and Steve did, he was on hospice care. And my first thought was, oh no, he's going to start talking about that priest again. But he didn't, because a week or two later, in one of the most beautiful and healing moments in the life of our family, the church came to him at the hospice center. My parents' pastor and about 25 members of the congregation showed up. And we had a little church service right there, and my dad answered these same questions of membership. And he promised to be an active and faithful member of that particular Methodist church. Dad was smiling from ear to ear. Mom finally got her way. <laughs> and as all good Methodists do, we celebrated not with wine and cheese, but with punch and cookies. And as I wheeled him back into his room, I helped him back in bed. He looked at me and he said, Jane, now we don't need a priest. Now I'm a Methodist. <laughs> he was dead and gone in another month, but I tell you the healing that happened that day, the new life we experienced was beautiful. All the angst that he had felt about not really being a Catholic anymore and not really being a Methodist was wiped away. And of course I know and you know whether my dad was a Roman Catholic on paper or a Methodist or floating somewhere in between. He was a beloved child of God, and he was headed on to the next step, no matter what. 
He was really a, officially a Methodist for just a few weeks before he died. But what a gift that was to him and to my mother, a gift of new life and healing in the last days of his life as he let go of the old and grabbed on to the new. And I sensed resurrection in the most powerful way that afternoon, and I was off the hook about finding a priest. <laughs> and judging from the number of mass cards that we received that day, and the number of Catholic friends and relatives that were sitting in that Methodist church, I'd say his bases were still covered. Today, we have been so blessed by the baptism of Clayton Wayne. I love baptisms, and I am so grateful to this family for sharing Clay with us. And you too, Sarah, you shared your brother with us. He is precious and beautiful. He is a beloved child of God, like each and every one of you. And when the waters of clay, when the waters of baptism washed over clay this morning, it was the promise of new life, not only for Clayton and his family, but for each and every one of you, as we were once again reminded of the radical, inclusive, never-ending power of God's love. Happy Easter, friends. The Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. The old is gone. A new life is upon you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, you come to us. You speak words over us. And you remind us that new life isn't just something that begins after death. It begins right now. That a new chapter can begin. That a new page can be turned. New things can be written. Things that we never imagined or conceived. God, remind us each and every moment that today is the eighth day. That you are going to do something new. That no matter how life feels old or how old we feel, that you are going to do something fresh and amazing in our lives. And God, all along you've been teaching us a prayer. It's a prayer that tells us that this earth becomes new, that this earth collides with heaven, that you bring your heaven to this earth. We lift up that prayer now saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.